The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai hoki mai ki a The Fold e mihi me ko Duncan Grieve to ku ingoa. This is a very special episode, I think. Um, my guest today is Lee Hart, uh, who might be my favourite New Zealand comedian, although as we discuss, it, it, you know, he doesn't even know whether to call himself that. Um, he might also be my favourite New Zealand media operator because basically if you look at his career, uh, he's he's done everything contra the accepted rule book or the way it's normally done, um, not just the 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 sort of what he makes, but how he makes it, how he funds it. The whole the guy's career is a total like bizarro masterclass in in innovation to me. And that's basically what the thesis of this is, is that Lee Hart, we think of him as just this really odd and funny guy. And he is, but he's also like probably one of the great media innovators uh, this industry has ever known. So Lee you know, he he started out in music, kind of drifted into to television through the production side, went on the other side of the camera on Sports Cafe, created Moon TV, which is his sort of masterpiece, and essentially built out what I describe as the Lee Hart cinematic universe. All of all of his characters and a lot of the sort of the IP that he would go on to to mine in different facets. Of, of the next 20 years was contained in you know th- those early sort of sketches. Um, uh, all of this stuff is available on Moonflix, by the way, which is his <laughs> bizarre, definitely copyright infringing with Netflix um, streaming site. So if you aren't familiar or any kind of uh, passingly familiar with him, you should check it out because, you know, as much as I think that this is really primarily on some level like a, a business slash creative thinking podcast, um, you also need to know what 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 it is he's made and why. You know he doesn't have the biggest fan base in New Zealand, but those people who love him are obsessed with him. Um, my cousin Casey, shout out, is is just an absolute obsessive uh, fan, and and there are just you know thousands and thousands more more like him, which means that you know he, despite breaking all of these rules around you know how television is funded and distributed, and you know the fact that he's gone, you know he's worked with sponsors but also created products, you know, in Wakachangi and Snakachangi himself, that uh, you know, he's 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 just built out this this completely um different, highly original uh, career for himself. So uh look, I it's 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 probably one of if not the longest episode of, of the fold I've done. It's it's a, a lot of fun. I think if you work in any aspect of the media whether it's creating things, distributing them, selling them, I think that there is there are kind of lessons in the creativity that Lee has brought to every aspect of what he does that uh, you know people we should pay attention to and we should valorize more to be honest because you know people I don't think really clock him for the true original that he is. Uh, so yeah, I think it's it's a lot of fun. This is Lee Hart on the fold. Kia ora, Lee, and uh, welcome to The Fold. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Beautiful, beautiful spot you have here. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so I guess I wanted to, to start, try, I mean, I've, I've been sort of scrutinising your career for, for a long time. I found it really interesting the way that it's plotted, and I want to kind of dig into that over the course of this interview. But I wonder if you could basically just start with with where your engagement with media began like there's some this it's there's a little crumbs everywhere and there's some sense that it might have come out of like the the music side is that well it's i'd call it without trying to be too much of a pun almost a comedy of errors (laughs) but if you look back on it there seemed to be logic at the time so 
Yeah, I'd never, I never had any thoughts at school of being into TV or film or that kind of stuff. It was definitely more music. Um, if anything, I wanted to, you know, I was in a band and I wanted to take that as far as we could. And we, we did that. We, we took as far as we could. Well, it wasn't that far, but we, we tried that. But then I came back from overseas and it must be in the nineties and we gave the band a break and I suddenly thought, okay, I've got to do something else. So I went to film and TV school. Um, and I thought, that, I don't know why I made that decision. I thought it might be something I, I, I could get into. But to do that, to sort of help me fund it, I started a newspaper <laughs> by myself called Moon. It was a sort of a 16-page, 24-page sometimes newspaper on newsprint, and I wrote every article in it. It was all just spoof articles, very sort of, um, you know, this kind of stuff, you know, ridiculous articles, and I'd and cut and paste, putting photos on there and gluing it, and I'd, I'd you know, literally, and then I'd send these sheets off, broadsheet things off to a printer in Timaru, They'd come back, and I have ten thousand copies of this half-assed newspaper. <laughs> and then I jump in a van and go around cafes and put them everywhere. So, so it was an ad-driven model. Oh yeah, I was I was selling the advertising as well. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> that was the hardest part. And I'd, I'd go around and I'd you know pretty much bully some little old woman in the cafe to to put a fifty-dollar ad in my newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so half-baked when I think about it. And there's full of typos. It was just the most horrendous thing. Have you still got some copies? Oh, yeah, I have. I'll, I'll drop some in. Yeah, please uh, do. Uh, to be honest, that I'm so glad I did it because I, I dined out on that for years. I was ripping articles out of that and turned them into skits later on on Moon TV, all sorts of stuff. So I, I did that, and it was it never really made any money, but it was, it was you know, it was something. And then I moved up. I did about 15 copies of it. So that's that was monthly. It was called The Moon, hence Monthly The Moon. Um, so it was about a year and a half of that. I moved up to Auckland to get work in TV. And it was through that that I actually got my first job in TV at Greenstone Pictures, um, a guy called John Harris, a great guy. Um, his daughter, Mandy Harris, said, you've got to meet this guy, Lee, um, this friend of mine. And he said, look, well, we can't take anyone on. But being an ex-journalist, the only thing that fascinated him was this idiot that had done his own newspaper and he'd seen it and it's full of typos and <laughs> it was embarrassing. But he said, well, there's got to be something going on here. So that, it's an example of just you give it a go and, you know, it may not make any money, but making that kind of effort. And God knows where I got the energy from because I don't have it anymore. So you've <laughs> got to make the most of it when you're young to do that kind of stuff because it will, will fade. And that's basically the guy said, well, I don't know, this is, I've, I've got to give him some kind of job here, you know. So I got like a, you know, internship kind of job at Greenstone Pictures, researching and doing a bit of writing and stuff. And that's kind of got me to TV. And then from there, I sort of went the other side of the camera, I suppose. But yeah. It's so, it's so interesting that, yeah, because it, it does feel like it's in some ways predicts and presages what you were to do in terms of not just making the content, but also owning the production side and, and yeah. figuring out ways, new ways to kind of oh, monetize oh, totally. that well so into the future. The attitude I brought from the newspaper found its way when I started making TV. So like I mentioned, a lot of the articles, there was articles about Bigfoot and Christchurch and things, uh, they end up becoming stories in Moon TV, the TV show that I made. So when I started my own TV show, it had to be called Moon TV. It was a little, it was just, you know, a little homage to that, I suppose. So when I think about it, I sort of forgot about the newspaper side of it. That started everything. That's really, you know, really interesting. So the the first, I think the first time I became aware of you, and probably the, and, and this might be the, the sort of first kind of mass audience you had was was Sports Cafe and this character, that guy, which yeah. which felt feels in some ways like the the first flowering of like okay, I'll I'll have this persona that is this kind of both a, a parody of and a tribute to some kind of TV type archetype. Yeah, I think so. So I was working at Greenstone Pictures as I say, making serious TV, but as a researcher, I think by that stage I was trying to get my own TV shows going and they would have been comedy-based, again, from the newspaper. Um, but I hadn't really jumped on the other side of the camera yet, and that was a pure fluke. I was at a, a mate's flat, not my flat, and Mark Ellis, who was you know obviously on the show then, came down to our flat. He actually tried to get my mate to go on the show that night as a fake guest because they're always short of guests. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's organised. And... And he didn't want to do it. And he said, no, that sounds really stupid. Go and ask Lee. He might do it. And I didn't know Mark that well, but I knew him. And he said, well, do you want to come on the show? And I said, oh, really? Okay. Oh, well, the next thing I know, I'm driving down to the Sky Studios 
in his car with a Tupperware container full of snails. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell am I doing here? And um, there's no studio audience then, so was, we did the show and I pretend to be this snail trainer character. <laughs> Apparently it went down quite well at the time. I didn't think it did because there was no laughter or anything. Um, so they asked me back the next week to do a follow-up story. And then, you know, luck would have it, they said, why don't you come on and do weekly sort of stories? And I remember the very beginning, I, I couldn't remember if I was trying to be a character or, or, or be myself. It was only later in years that you just had the confidence to be just yourself. I remember I was giving myself fake names when I was interviewing people. But eventually, yeah, you just you just – evolved into yourself, an exaggerated version of yourself, I suppose. And, yeah, and, and taking the piss out of the, this, the other journalists, I suppose, you know, just an exaggerated version of why don't they ask that question? You know, why do they keep asking the same stupid questions, you know? So so because Sports Cafe is, feels like quite an interesting show to me, like in that, you know, it was, it was probably – it wasn't as strange as some of the things that you and you know, back of the wire and eating media lunch would go on to do, but it did feel it does feel like it's got connective tissue to oh, that, that weird comedy oh, that was to come on. Big time. So my, my job was to do a three minute, a two and a half minute story, but we always ran it out to three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> three and a half minutes. Um basically on the same old thing. Um, it's a good example of having structure and then rebelling against it is often a good thing to have. So in other words, this week, like Tuesday, you've got to go down and interview the Crusaders. They're playing the Chiefs this week. And there we go. So we go down each week, same thing. There might be a hockey story. There might be whatever. But it was pretty much this. Uh, uh, it's either going to be a media huddle story or a preemptive story about what's happening. It was never ready after the fact. It was this week the Crusaders are taking on the Blues and we'll do a build-up story. And it just got so repetitive to the stage where how can we make this different? So I was starting to get the brief and go, okay, how can we do the opposite to this but still pretty much do what we're supposed to do? And got to the stage where Rick Sleetso, the the, <laughs> the guy running the thing, was going, because we would deliver it. It was quite hard editing back in those days, pretty much minutes before the show went to air. And he hadn't a chance, he didn't have a chance to almost see it, so he, he would throw the There's story no alive saying. on air. And I could see his face just drop sometimes, you know. The very very first speed cooking was an example of that. It was supposed to be a sports story that week. <laughs> and I I think I was hung over, to be honest, on a Monday or a Tuesday and not feeling that great, but more, more like not feeling not feeling like engaging with people. So I remember Brent um, Spillane, the cameraman who I still work with, he was sitting at my flat and he's sort of twiddling his thumbs, okay, what are we going to do? It's getting close to the wire now. I'm going to have to edit this. Let's come up with something. And I'm going, oh, God, precious building, precious building. I said, why don't we just do something here in the house, you know? <laughs> like what? I said, well, I don't know. Let's just do some. What could you do as a sport in the house? It might have been a cooking show on TV. I can't remember. But imagine that was a sport, cooking a meal as fast as you could. <laughs> so I put a headband on, and, and the first one was basically supposed to be a sports story. It had a tracksuit on and I made a meal. And and as I say, we did two or three of those on Sports Caf, and that found its way into Moon TV. So, yeah, it all started definitely on that show. The, the way that that developed into – into Moon TV, like, you know, th- that, that show feels extremely transgressive in, much, in a bunch of ways. Like, it, it takes these kind of banal tropes of, of television and, like you said, yeah. just kind of leans into the absurdity of them. You know, the, something like speed cooking feels like it feels like it's destroying whatever room it's in and it clearly yeah. isn't, doesn't yeah, feel yeah. like it's a set, you know? Oh, no, totally. There has to be an element of realism about it. And we often, you know, you're making a TV show, you go, okay, what we'll do there, we'll do this, this, and this. Go, hold on, wouldn't it be funny if that actually, the, the context is everything, I think. Why is this funny? Why would someone be laughing about it? It's because the guy across the road who looked across and saw you open the car door and the door fly off. <laughs> That's why it's funny because it felt real. It's not funny if that was in the studio. Likewise, a cooking show, because we've talked about, why don't we do one in a sort of a um, master chef type environment? Okay, that, that would work if you had everyone else doing their, their meals <laughs> and stuff, and that would work then. But if you were just on your own in a master chef environment, it's not that funny because it's a constructed environment. It's it's fake anyway. That's why non doctors work. So yeah, we're totally. just across the yeah, road yeah. from uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, totally. the set. <laughs> oh, totally. And I think that's everything. And even the people we use as well, we used a few actors here and there, but most of them really were mates a lot of the time. And people can sort of sense that as well. And people really thought that they've actually done this. You know, they actually. That's why I started wearing less moustaches and wigs and stuff in a way. I used to hate it anyway. But straight away it felt 
contrived. That the more real it felt, um, the better for me. Um, yeah, known doc's a good example. That's a ridiculous construct in a real environment, you know. Or you <laughs> know, if that was done in a fake set, it wouldn't have worked. No. It, likewise, late night big breakfast is it's in a real furniture store. Which is currently operating as a furniture store while you're shooting. Oh, totally. Correct? Yeah, oh, totally. They um, it was almost they they would they would um, you'd have customers wandering around avoiding us, and we would say to the staff, and they even have people part of our crew making sure they come through. Say, no, no, don't worry about it. They don't mind. Come through the back, and and people forgot about us after a while, and they almost took it too far. They were actually starting to look at price tags on the back <laughs> <laughs> back of a couch that we're we're talking on, and I love that. I know because I'd only watched the editor. I couldn't believe it. There's some guy there. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's what sort of makes it work. Um, I suppose often, I, don't, I wouldn't say I spend too much time doing this, but I go around in circles a lot, probably too much lately. It seems to be more of a, I used to be a lot more instinctive. Now I seem to second guess everything. Oh, maybe it's funny if we don't do it here. Maybe it's, you know, because um, there's things I'd would, I would do differently if, if we could do it again. But often it's the, the context is is everything, you know. These were quite, you know, these were sort of strange and transgressive shows. And you can imagine, like, you're going to pitch a show that is basically all about the absurdity of television to people whose main job is commissioning that absurd yeah. television. Like, on some level, it almost feels unimaginable that it even happened. Like, how did you sort of, how did it get across? How did you fund it? Well, you know, because, yeah. like, these these shows are, are very, very strange looking back. And you think about that was a much... That what you know, now we, we live in the a kind of an era of where the internet's exploded everything. But back then it was hard to get in the well, door. Well it's interesting, like I remember in the in the proposals, um using the word irreverent about fifty times <laughs> I just got sick of it. But just it's an irreverent show. In in other words, it's you know. But the thing was, and this was a blessing now. At the time, it wasn't. Our time slots originally were like 11 o'clock at night, this sort of stuff at TV2, even though it's got, you know, 10, 30, 11. I was struggling to try and get on earlier so more people could see it. But back then, 11 o'clock, there's probably more people watching TV than now at we're, we're 8 o'clock. Prime time. Yeah. So, and the beauty of that is they didn't really care. As long as I delivered the show, oh, yeah, silly old Lee, you'll just do whatever. And I'd always deliver it on time. But the beauty of that is I ended up owning all the rights and stuff to it because they never really put much money into it. Um, by and large, New Zealand and Air a couple of times I got funded. Um, and I just got, again, the laziness, I just got sick of doing the dual um, proposal system. You know, you have to go to New Zealand Air, then TVNZ, and it's, it's jumping through hoops, basically. But most people don't have a problem with that. Um, so I actually didn't mind going down the sp- sponsorship route model. So, so you were so you were funding these things, not not like TVNZ weren't paying, New Zealand on Air weren't paying. You were just figuring out the how first to... couple New Zealand on Air. No, the first couple I self funded. The first series I made for about six thousand dollars, literally, and I was using a lot of footage I already used on SportsCaf and repatronized it into another show and put some links around it. So little steps, and then I think I got Auto Trader to sponsor the first right. one on Sky. But then they applied for New Zealand Air funding for the first TVNZ show, and we got we got that, and we probably have three or four fundings I think from New Zealand Air. Um, and then and we did other shows like Mysterious Planet and stuff. But it got to a stage where I started doing the thing which I'm literally doing as we speak. We'll probably talk about it a bit later. Uh, I wouldn't call it an arrogant kind of thing, but it's almost an, a lazy thing. I would go. To TV and Z. Um, hope they're not listening. <laughs> I'll go, hey, look, I've got um, some sponsors that are really keen for me to do another series kind of thing. Um, I said, oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, now I could deliver it. What time slots could you give me? And they said, oh, we've got a we'll give you 9 30, 10 o'clock on um, Duke and TV2 um, later, in, later in the year. And I go, great, cool. And I'll use that. Then I'll go to a sponsor and go, Team Z have approached me and they want to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they're looking for sponsors. It's a confidence to, 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 game. Yeah, totally. And, but the attitude was to both parties was, well, I'm making this anyway with yeah. or without you. So you might as well come along or don't because if you don't, someone else will. We're going to make it. And that seems to work. Um, but as I say, you still have to find sponsors, and I'm literally doing that as we speak for – Current series, which <laughs> probably just pulled the rug out of it. If you're listening, <laughs> and you're getting... <laughs> if you are listening, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, what, what's sort of interesting to, to me is you know, I mean, some some people listening will obviously be for, you, know, you know potentially in the TV industry. Others will have no idea that this is a deeply unconventional way to go about things. For the yeah. most part, networks either create their own shows or, or even more often they'll 
either buy them from overseas or yep. if they're a local show, they will be funded by New Zealand on, on yeah, air. Yeah, totally. I always, I, I don't like, I suppose, seeking permission to do something, whether it's TV or otherwise. If you want to do it, you should do it. Um, and if that means using TVNZ sponsorship department to help get money, that's fine. Or, you know, of course you work in with people. But we've, every show we've made, we've always broken the mould of, look, I'll look at credits on a TV show and there'll be 30, 40 people on it. Um, we would have to make up names. If we, <laughs> that. we literally have three people working on a show, you know, other than the people you see on the cast. There's I'll write, direct, and I suppose you'd have to say produce and be in it. Um, Brent will shoot it with other cameramen and he'll edit it with me and we'll have some other people on the day if it's that kind of shoot, like the late night big breakfast, there'll be other crew, of course, then. But there's no big list of line producers, this and that, and people you don't even know what they're doing on the show. It just doesn't really ha- well, it doesn't work that way. So we can do it for less budget anyway and still make the same amount of money without looking cheap, hopefully, though they did look pretty cheap. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But that's the charm. It is. Well, and it, it feels very intentional. The, the thing that's interesting to me as well is, is that this is going out on TVNZ, you know, like our, our national network. A lot of the shows that you were parodying were also TVNZ shows, you know, the likes yeah. of Good Morning and Short One Street yep. and so on. Did you, inevitably, even though you feel like this rogue agent sort of operating off in the hills, inevitably you do come into contact with those people. How do they tend to respond to Yeah, I, I think when package? we say you're parodying those shows, but it's you're really parodying something larger. It's really a genre, really. Yeah. You know, morning TV sort of thing. Uh, of course, TVNZ has a morning show, but we're not really parodying that. I mean, there's that, that genre's been around for, for years all overseas. Um, likewise with um, Nine Doctors, it wasn't really <laughs> Shortland Street. As it was just a soap opera. You yeah. Know, yeah. That had been around forever. Probably the closest we ever came to parodying anything um, was Speedo Cops. And which was you could argue was parod- parodying Motorway Patrol. Yeah. And the funny thing about that, but but I'd argue we were just parodying again reality TV. Yeah. Because I worked Greenstone Pictures on Motorway Patrol. I actually wrote the proposal that got the show funded. Wow. When I was at Greenstone, and I was still working. I was doing Moon TV when I was still at Greenstone, right? And this is how close the two were. We were shooting on um, DV tapes then. Okay. I was actually using the motorway patrol. So John Harris, he knew I had no budget. He said, you can use these secondhand DV tapes that we've shot motorway <laughs> patrol on because they would only use one pass on them. We'd use two or three, you know, because they had a budget. They wouldn't use them again. Um, so I was shooting the parody, I suppose, of motorway patrol, speedo cops, on the same tapes that actually shot the original series. And the funny thing about that, because I went, rode with the police on motorway patrol. This is how much I know or don't. To write the proposal, I was writing with the police that night and I was going, oh, not a lot happens really, you know. So I remember coming back to John and going, ah, oh, I don't think there's a show on it. It's, it's, it's nothing really happens. It's just kind of tedious, you know. And, and, you, got, and you know, he put the proposal anyway and got funded. It's been going for 25 years, <laughs> probably the biggest show they've ever had. <laughs> but that was it. What else, when we did um, Speedo Cops, okay, we, we put Speedos on. But you're not supposed to notice that. We don't really reference yeah, it. That, the only, the, yeah, the, that's, that's the just, only odd thing about it. That's the only it. odd thing about it. Everything else for parodying is the fact that it's the voiceover, really. Nothing really happens. But then drama. He can't open the door. You know, but then drama. You know, it, it's, you just keep saying that all the time and you get a TV show out of it after the break. Then drama. You know, it's just, <laughs> we just, and that's all we were doing. And I found reality TV was that. You're making four minutes of actual TV and stretching it out for 25. Um, so that's what Speedo Cops was about. Of course, it had to be ridiculous scenarios, but we weren't going to be going into ridiculous situations all the time. It was normal situations um, handled badly with incompetence, but drama, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of that that sort of business side of things, I mean, like you've sort of already already nodded at it in terms of the, you know, the way that you played off uh, t- TVNZ and, and the sponsors and so on. But, you know, one thing that you've ultimately ended up with is is this sort of, is ownership as the creator of yeah. this giant archive 
uh, yeah. which is now available on, on Mo- uh, Moonflix. <laughs> Moonflix, yes. <laughs> I'm just waiting for Netflix to sue us so I can get some publicity on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like, and, and you know, I sort of, like I remember with the with the, the lockdown specials, which were, yes. you know, I, I really, really enjoyed. Like, that was just basically, again, it was like a clip show with, with some links. Like, you know, what, again, like, how how did the the idea of kind of owning your your own work or, or how how has the fact that you own your own work right through kind of I impacted your career and and yeah you know, why is it that that what you do is so different to to what other kind of similar type creatives would, would yeah I think to? originally um, it happened that way as I say it was this reverent show that you know no one knew who I was trying to get funded. So by default, I ended, ended up owning the. It was like no one wanted yeah, well, that's to. That's so well, we haven't put any money into it, so we don't, obviously don't have any license fee on it. So they only had to put a tiny bit in, and they would actually would have ended up owning all that sort of stuff. Um, so at the time, it was frustrating, and I remember getting really irate with um, you know commissioners and stuff, and you know we, we weren't getting taken seriously and all this sort of stuff. Um, but it was only after a few years that you started to realize, you know what, you know, as as I suppose the online world started to become. A thing because we started before that, and once that started happening, we started. You know, we can we can share all this sort of stuff now. Is and I had to say it was some like you know Jeremy Wells. You know, he was making some great stuff at the time as well. Like eating, eating lunch, all this sort of stuff. TVNZ own all that sort of stuff, and it's just sitting in a drawer. It That's the get, thing; it doesn't. It's know, not even it's available. Wasted. If I was him or or the company that made it in Great Southern, I'd, I'd buy it back. Yeah, and do you know because it's the value. There's value in it. You know, it was great stuff. Um, so it was by default that I ended up owning, but after a while I started having that attitude, um, looking at the contract and going, okay, but um, you guys, when they were going, well, we're only going to put this much in, there's just a license fee to air it. I was going, yeah, great, that's fine. I'll find the money elsewhere, knowing full well that I would end up owning it. Um, yeah. You know, And that means not just for online, you can sell it. To overseas, you know, I ended up putting Moon stuff on TV3 at one point, you know, that was, was on TV2 originally. Yeah, because you've also, like, there's a lot of your clips on YouTube, which, which perform yeah. really well. Do you monetize on that platform? Well, that's it's hard because you, you try to. Um, I've got to be honest, you know, I'm just contradict myself. You know, owning it's all very well and good, but it's still it's very hard to monetize it because other people are just putting it out there anyway. I mean, there's other people who put the same clip up that I have and they've got more views than the version I put up. You know what I mean? It, it's ridiculous. Or even it's good to making be memes and th- of stuff, and it's just ridiculous. It's all overseas. It's everywhere. And you, you can't – you get frustrated with it. It's on American clip shows. You see these clips and go, how are they doing this, you know? And there's no real sort of money in it other than if you package it properly again, you know, and make a, another show. And that, that's, I think, where Moonflix kind of started, more as an archive for us to get it all in, in, the, in the one place at, at a good, um, you know, resolution and stuff um, so people can sort of search it. And I think the only way to monetize it that way is not a paywall or anything but um, with sort of sponsors. So we can take a clip off and put a sponsor into it and, and then put it back on kind of thing, you know. Um, and those sponsors might even be ourselves, if that makes any sense, like, say, the chips or the beer, that kind of stuff. It's giving it, giving um, some content to hang messages and stuff on, I suppose. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has the lowdown on everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. Join some of the superstars of the investment and business world as they share advice from their time in the US so you can make your mahi count in this massive market. The Investment Fix Podcast, brought to you by Invest New Zealand. Tune in today. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. 
Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. Yeah, because I, I mean that's that's a good segue into talking about the the that because you initially you know was I, I don't know what your first engagement was, but I certainly the Hellers one has become the sort yeah. of iconic uh, Lee Hart thing, yep. which is is just normal enough to sell a sausage, but also still very much you doing your thing. Yeah, yeah, that they that was an agency approached me. So the Hellers is a different model than everything else because I'm literally their spokesperson. Yeah, um, you know, I get paid to do that, which is great, and I, I believe in the brands, and everything, so it, it's good. And and originally, I had no real sort of you know say in the content of the ads or anything. I'm just basically I show up and, and do that. Um, over the years, that sort of changed. I mean, they've gone through about three or four ad agencies in that time since I've been there. I'm still there. Well, that's very rare. Yeah, for- oh, exactly. Yes, I've become the Briscoe's guy of of <laughs> small goods, which is no, <laughs> which is fine. Sense. Which I see, for a while I was going, oh, I don't but it's 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 great. It's a it's a it's, a, it's been a great thing that's also allowed me to, I suppose, make decisions more in my own terms. You know, the Hellers have been a great. Um, support network, I suppose, you know. It gives you sort of an underlying yeah, income yeah. stream that you can allow you to go off and oh, do weird totally. stuff and just hope it works. Yeah, you can do the stuff and and and, just, and, and it keeps on the straight and narrow too because you obviously want to make, you know, you, you're doing things on instinct, but, you know, you want to respect that brand. You know, what, you know it keeps you, um, it, it keeps a good eye in the commercial world, I suppose. You're not going to go off and make some ridiculous thing that's going to, that they'd be offended by. You know what I mean? Yeah, not yeah. That that's, I don't think that way, but I, I suppose if I did, that would, you know. Um, so that was great. And often I've, I can, our production company often makes a lot of that content, especially with the online stuff now. So that that's another another part of it. So that's a, like almost a business on the side, mm. and it's ongoing. And it's had a great, uh, they're quite a big company now, but they still feel like a family, you know, to deal with. So I made the decision quite early to deal directly with them, and sort of almost short circuit the agency kind of thing because I, I sort of felt that my oh, what's my what's the word for it my my longevity or my it was only as good as the agencies if I'm attached to the agency if, if you know what I mean because yeah. the new agency of course they want to rebrand and get a new thing That's they might they, they, pitch, they yeah. might get a a dog to be the, the face of Hellas, you know and maybe they should it's not a good you idea, it's not a bad idea <laughs> not, is it? Oh, shit, I, I wish I hadn't mentioned that this much quite good <laughs> we'll delete that probably my dog they'll use um, but what I mean is having a direct thing with them I feel you can communicate the message better, you know what they're thinking, and get it across. Be more on brand, I suppose, you know. But then the the big thing you do after that, which, again, like this speaks to the, the sort of unconventional genius of it, is you created the product. So the, yeah. it's Waka Changi and then mm. um, Snaka Changi, which both of which feel like massive consumer. Oh, yeah, it's, especially good. the chips now. It's, it's really big. But the beer started with... Again, it wasn't a sort of thing, oh, God, I want to make something, make a whole lot of money. It was more subtle than that. I remember we were doing Moon TV and you'd do a series, 10 episodes or six episodes, whatever it was, and it was all-consuming. It was great. And you get a few reviews in the paper and even you, know, you guys were doing it. It's great. And you feel really cool about yourself. But then two weeks later, it's done. Everyone's, you know, everyone's talking about something else. <laughs> and you've got another six months before you do another show and you start the funding thing again. It seemed to be like, but meanwhile, the Wellington Sevens would be on and everyone's dressed up as Moon TV characters, a hamster man and speedo cops and stuff. And you go, that's not weird. Is there any way of trying to capitalise on that goodwill, I suppose? Not not so much financially, but to trying to keep the story going, yeah. you know? Um, and all I could think of was perhaps a brand, you know. It might have been T-shirts or something I could have thought of. But for some reason, I th- we were sitting in the office, I thought I might start a beer brand. You know, there's two people in the office. <laughs> and they went, oh, really? Okay. And um, <laughs> so I just literally, I'm quite impulsive. And they said, oh, you should think about that a bit more and maybe come up with a really cool brand. I said, oh, let's just feel the market first. So I just did a Facebook post that said, think of starting a beer brand, might call it Wacker Changi, you know, because that was a, a word we had from a sports cafe story about the Waikato River. And back then, of course, I suppose Facebook was kind of bigger than it was. There was just thousands of 
comments and stuff to the point where, oh, shit, we've got to do it now. <laughs> yeah. So next thing I'm on the phone, ringing up breweries, oh, can you make beer really quick um, in time for the orientation, which is in four weeks? And there's a brewery in Christchurch, and they, they said, yeah, yeah, we can do it. We'll just repatch another beer and we'll get some labels made up. And that's kind of what we did. And that worked really well. And all of a sudden you found it, it was on brand with everything, with everything yeah. else. Because even the copy that's on that and on the chips as well, yeah, you know, it feels yeah. on some level like it goes back oh, to, totally. the, to, the, to the newspaper. Yeah, exactly right. At full circle, it was the same gibberish, the same style of writing that was from the newspaper would be on the on the back of the label. Um, so nothing's changed really in that sense. That's the, that's the essence of it is that language really, I think, from the newspaper. Yeah, I've never, there you go. I've never thought about that before. <laughs> And and the, those things have kind of grown, and and like you say, that basically has become these these consumer products that can be the sponsor of a, of any unsold inventory across you know your, yeah. your moon flips. And but so you've on. got to be careful with that too, because you don't want to get what's the word for it? I'm too clever. I, I think the let's take the chips for example. So the chips morphed out of the beer. That, that's pretty obvious. Again, through frustration because. The the beer was going well, but we were waiting for a, a canning line to be built at the brewery, and it was all getting a bit. Oh, and just sort of twiddling your, your thumbs a bit. Mm. We, there's no real new story we could bring out. And on some level, you were licensing the brand to Harrington's. Oh, no, no, by this stage, the beer had changed. So McCashin's Brewery in Nelson, they oh, yeah. came on board as half partner, like an ownership. Right. And, and we someone, that. You, you don't necessarily want to be actually like down there matching no. hops and well, dealing with distributors and well, so on. In the very beginning, that's what we were doing. I was, you know, I was trying to make a TV show and, and then we're chasing up a lost pallet down in <laughs> Omaru, you know. So there's the, Katie who was working, she came on as a, a producer on the show. <laughs> she was chasing up broken bottles down here. And I was saying, look, don't worry about it. It's all TV. It's all the same stuff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she said, this is not what I signed up for, you know. And it was a great experience for us all, but we could, uh, then I shut it down actually because uh, we weren't losing money, but. It got to this, it got a little bit dangerous because once we had a barcode, supermarkets could pretty much order that in, and we were getting beer in you know supermarkets in Northland, and then getting invoices for displays and that they've done in the supermarket, and we had no budget for anything, you know, so I sort of shut it down without losing a cent, and then about a year later, McCashins got in touch and said, "What well, should we start it up again?" And they came on as half owner, and they were like, "Yep, yeah, the brewer, the distributor." Took care of all the the hard part, and I just did the marketing, I suppose, um, and that was great. And as I say, we got to a stage where you could we were making ads and, and messages, but um, you couldn't just keep saying, "Hey, drink Wacker Jangy, it's great." You know, we, we'd almost maxed where we're going to get to. Um, so I thought, shit, why not do um, chips? Uh, I think it was nuts originally I was thinking, but then sort of chips. But um, approached Griffins to do that. And this is where I suppose I have to take some credit, I think, for uh, it, when you're, uh, you know, a quasi-comedian, I suppose, um, which is subjective in itself. People I want to talk about that, actually. <laughs> people assume, oh, yeah, cool, yeah, all right, we'll do these chips. What are they going to be? They're going to be Marmite and Jello flavor, which, you know, because it's going to be wacky because yeah. your, your, your shows are wacky. But hold on. The shows are actually within a format. We're, we're, we're just putting a twist on a reality TV show. We're just putting a twist on a breakfast show. It's still what it is. Yeah. I said, no. I said, well, what are your top selling flavors? They said, well, salt and vinegar, salted, chicken. Well, well, let's do those. You know, that makes sense. That, yeah. You know, don't worry about the wacky stuff. We'll take so care of that. the packet. Yeah, that, that'll be just a twist. We'll call it vinegar and salt instead of salt and vinegar, you know, or whatever, chicken with a typo in it. <laughs> um, but it's still chicken because that's what – people are going to eat. Yeah. So it's that old thing where you get, you might as well have a small share of a big market than a big share of a tiny market kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of what we did. And it's weird that it was it was me that directed it that way as opposed to, to the the corporate brands yeah. at the other end, if you know what I mean. So Because well, they were looking at it as this one-off silly marketing yeah, thing, whereas yeah. you were looking at it as a business. Oh, totally. And the silly marketing, that's the easy part. I can I can sort of sort that out. But it's likewise, I mean, we do corporate videos for, um, you know, any any sort of business and stuff. And it's often for me that's trying to make ensure that the, the actual message is getting across still, if you know what I mean. Like, I don't, the comedy has to be at my expense, so to speak, not the product or the brand or the, the company that you're talking about, they still have to come across in the right way. And likewise with the chips, it's still got to be a legitimate, great um, 
tasting and it's got to be in a proper packet. You, can't, you know, you can't half-ass that stuff. And then you just put the, the comedy, the twist on that. It has to be, can be subtle, you know. Um, and I think that's the approach you've got to take with everything. Otherwise, you'd just be a loose cannon running around just all sorts of stuff. You know, it's... But but it's obviously gone well enough. That, like, like I mean, it, you know, we we, we rated it. Uh, yeah. I think the, the the greatest chip in the country. It's not. not I mean, obviously, that alone will have yeah, had a well, huge it, it impact did. on sales. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it does. And that kind of um, what's the word for it? Marketing unsolicited. I can only do so much, if you know what I mean. And you're preaching the converted. You've got you got your sort of the people that will listen to you. But when it comes from a, a third party, yeah. that, that's the best stuff you can get. So how how has the the fact that you now have these consumer products, you know, and with the chips, as you say, even more yep. successful than the beer? How has that changed your your sort of creative life? I don't think it has. If anything, it's it's again, it's great to. Oh, I've got a new flavor coming out, and I've got to knuckle down and start writing again. I get you know, it's it's, it's like having to write something again. You got a deadline. They they need to pack it by tomorrow, and I'm still trying to write the back thing, you know, and I'm still <laughs> got typos in it. And, and it's great. It's great because it's an it's another creative release. It's a bit like I used to do columns for the Herald on Sunday. Um, and it was kind of the bane of my life. I mean, again, the deadline, et cetera, with it. But it was a great creative release as well. It's a Why you weren't yeah. doing a TV show. And I'm quite, I don't know if it's a good thing, whatever. I'm quite efficient at recycling stuff. So if I was about to do a TV show, often I'd go back through all my Held on Sunday articles and just read is there anything there that could actually be converted into something visual, you know, a visual sort of story? Oh, maybe it's a piss take, you know, even lines. It doesn't have to be the whole story, it just could be a one liner or something, you know, that someone can use. And likewise, the original Moon articles. I still trawl through some of those sometimes. There must be something I haven't used, you know. <laughs> and then, then if I, if I go through it, yeah, I've definitely used everything. Then I start going, okay, got to come up with something new. <laughs> and radio was great too. Um, the problem with radio, I found it was you, you're throwing stuff away all the time. You, you say something, it doesn't get archived. Yeah, kind of it well. doesn't. And, yeah. and I remember going back and saying, "Can we get all those?" Shows on tape. Why would you want that? And you could only get so many. It's just logistically hard. But then having to sit there and listen to them and see if there's anything in there, you know. Um, I wish I was more disciplined and, and write something down at the time. But that seems to, I don't know, seems to be um, kills. It, 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 well, it's, yeah, it feels like it's kind of antithetical yeah, to, the, to the media. Yeah, totally. The, the, the spontaneous nature of it. But um, yeah, it's sort of waste. Not you know, you really need to. If it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Well, I mean, on some level, like it feels like Moon TV is is your Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like you've got yeah. this this a whole bunch of IP, all these characters, and you monetize it. You know, you yeah, know, chips are your theme parks. Like like that. Like there's just a really interesting and completely different system that you've developed over <laughs> compared to the conventional industry. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think sometimes it might be quite nice to maybe visually. You know, I used to love whiteboards and that, but I never did that. I never, I never put that in the middle and, and tried to structure it. It seems to be, well, a comedy of error is not the sort of thing. But it seems to be like a linear thing. You're just on to the next thing, on to the next thing, and it all does link in. But you sort of realise that maybe after the fact a little bit. You, you were, all, you've always felt to me like a, you know, this kind of auto who operates on a bit of an island, and and you know, it, it was interesting when you said. You know, like, am I am I a comedian? Like you, yeah. you obviously are, because like you're cracking people up. It has been your business for for a long time now. But you don't go and do like hour long stand up sets at the classic that I'm aware of, and you feel like quite remote to the balance of the New Zealand comedy industry. Like, what what's your sort oh, of relationship oh, to t- it? Totally, it's I do feel like an outsider, and I always have, um, and that's my own doing. I think I, I don't avoid people, as I say. I don't do stand up. A lot of people think, you know, a comedian has to do stand up. Yeah. But when I say don't do stand up, I used to do a lot of emceeing and, and speaking at stuff where you actually are standing up for an hour and they only got you there to make them laugh. So yeah. you are doing stand up. But what I mean is, I'm not going out there and saying, I'm going to tell you 30 jokes in the next 10 minutes. It, you're out there and it's, again, the context. It's funny because you're, you're the MC and you've mucked something up and, you know, something this goes wrong, you know, and you haven't, you know, it's the bigger picture that's it's funny. It's playing, playing this, this sort of character. Yeah, of yeah a, the character yeah. of a, a bad MC, or, yeah. you know, or it's, it's almost the character, isn't it? It's sort of, 
let's do a travel show, but maybe instead of Michael Palin, doing, let's get the worst possible guy <laughs> to do his job. You know, it's that's the sort of thing. Likewise with the emceeing. So, so look nowadays, uh, I, uh, look, I take my hat off to stand up comedians, right? But everyone's a stand up comedian now. I mean, there's more stand up comedians in New Zealand than probably chefs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you walk out of school at seventeen now and go, I'm a stand up comedian. I'm funny. Go on stage and. Next thing you're probably going to be on TV as well. But it doesn't really mean you're a stand-up comedian or, or you're that funny, if you know what I mean. It could be, but it doesn't mean you are. Just, 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 you just saying it doesn't, yeah, yeah it's it's not the proof a, you is in the work. You don't become, it's not like a job description. You can't, can't just go to university and get enough points and you're a comedian now. It doesn't work that way, you know. And some people, the funniest people that I know, don't even work in TV or have any interest in doing that, you know. Um, and they would say they're a lot funnier than me, and a lot of them probably are. But, you know, stuff them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, in, in, over the last 10 years, you know, you've gone from being that kind of auteur sort of island on your own to, to joining up a bit with some people who were your contemporaries in that 2000s yep. weird TV comedy era, the yep. Eating Media Lunch and Back of the Y, the sort of holy trinity of the thing. Yep. Maybe a little bit of Pulp Sport as well. But um, the, the ACC yep. has become this kind of super group um, for all that. Like, you know, how, how have you found, you know, that, that you know, sort of pushing all of your three different, like, related but but um, but still very idiosyncratic yeah, styles together? It's good because we all sort of um, a similar sort of generation, which helps. But what, what's weird about it is with the ACC, let's take, say, Jeremy and Matt Heath, for example, because the because shows you mentioned, Back of the Wire and Eating Me Lunch, et cetera, um, I've worked with Jeremy on TV, never really met, but on the ACC we're almost doing something that none of us did. So none of us are trying yeah. to be none of us are trying to be, oh, it's my style of show or it's it's more like this. We're not making a TV show together because I don't know if that would work. Who knows? Well, obviously we've worked with Jeremy, but um, we're doing something totally different. It's just more like a like-minded friends kind of thing and there's no we're not no one feels threatened or anything we're just having fun and and having a bit of a laugh you know and uh it's great um and and like you said it's great working with people um instead of being that island all the time you know because it does you know get lonely to be honest yeah you know <laughs> i can imagine that though i can and I, and I can almost sense it especially because you know, just as the same as like, you know, when Hillers changes agency, there's this potential pressure to change. Like, you know, you get a new commissioner or you go sort of off yeah. the oil at TV and then you kind of don't, where, where do you put your creative juice, you know? Yeah, I just I, I just assume that whoever's at TVZ, hopefully, or TV3, I should, you know, if I go in there with the right, right attitude and a good idea, hopefully you can get a show over the line, probably more so than, say, you know, a 20-year-old guy who hasn't been on TV, I suppose. Yeah, so, yeah, you definitely have So you can't advice. take that for granted. But, that's true. And that, and, but that's because over the years, I would argue – Kind of have under-promised, over-delivered kind of thing, you know, certainly on the budget side of things, you know, <laughs> because they have, they've put very little in and they've still got 10 episodes, which people talk about, you know. Yeah. Not, not that everyone liked, you know, you can't please everyone, but they got results kind of thing as opposed to, you know, another show that cost them, you know, a million and, and uh, you know, one series, whatever. Because um, I'm going to make, as I say, I'm going to make the show regardless, you know. It's whether they want to come along for the ride is the sort of the attitude I've had. I've got to be careful not to be too, what's the word for it, um, you know, too you know, tough on that or, you know, you could be a bit cocky sort of thing. But um, Yeah, ultimately it has to be a product. Yeah, no one's going to, you know, as I say, you don't want to wait for permission to do something, you know. If you want to do it, you'll, you'll find a way. It seems like great advice. So, what? What? It feels like it's been a, a little while by your standards since we saw you on TV. What, what's yeah. your? What's next? What's coming? Yep. Well, the next thing <laughs> is a TV show. The last show we did was Late Night Big Breakfast, um, I think, on TV, and we were supposed to do another ten episodes of that. That's right. You said that was supposed to be a monster season. It was supposed right? to be twenty episodes. Yeah. I kind of knew when we got that across the line that I was only going to do ten. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, and I'm, 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 uh, there's probably a lot of people out there thinking, "Oh no, do another, 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 another ten. But that show is quite hard for me in particular to make um, because obviously we've got Jace on there, who's great, um, and we need that. But I'm pretty much the only one coming up with the actual 
ideas and everything. It's actually quite draining sort of on me. Um, so, and then without bringing the, the C word into it, you know, the COVID, I've, I just feel like now that show we were sitting on couches is quite stationary, quite static, a lot of fun. Why not make, I just feel like getting out and about, yeah. you know, getting out and seeing people and let them help make the show. In other words, you know, just be more animated and a bit more energy to the whole thing. Mobile, I suppose, and stuff COVID, let's just do it. So naturally I thought, let's do a travel show around New Zealand. Nothing new about that, but we'll call it Heartland with an, with an A, you know. <laughs> and again, it will just be, and that's great, and that's probably what it's going to be, unfortunately. I don't mean unfortunately. But then I thought, shit, okay, if we really want to get animated, why not really stuff it to COVID and do a road trip across the States? You know, Route 66 style. Wow. And that's ideally what I want to do because, and it's supposed to be on in October, by the way. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you, I'm, like, I'm assuming you haven't done. No, the I haven't trip. done it yet. So, but the beauty of that concept for me, the way I sort of work nowadays, is that it'll be, I'll fly in on that date, you fly out of that, you know, three or four weeks, and you'll get everything you need because you have to. You know, um, you, there's no two ways about it. And then you can come back and edit. But I'm assuming you're doing this without any permission to do it. Like, you, Oh, I've, no, I've talked to TV there. They know that I'm trying to do this. But, but, but I mean, you, have you talked to uh, President Biden? No. You know, or his representatives? I've yeah. talked to Trump. <laughs> 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 no, I haven't talked to anyone. Well, look, I worry so, about that when, when we get, if we if we get enough money to do it. But it might be a case of we'll just head over and do it. Yeah. I, mean, we, I filmed in the States for Mysterious Planet. We did the Bigfoot and Roswell and stuff. It's great, great. And sure. that was, we didn't get permission for that, I don't think. It doesn't but, feel like the kind of thing that you do is. No, is you get sort permission. of have permission later kind of thing, because otherwise you know, there'll be too many hoops to jump through. But ideally, that would be great. My fear is with the New Zealand one, A, you're in the wrong season to be filming for hmm. October to get it out. It's a bit winterish. But being here, it's how long's a piece of string? Oh, let's go back. To Christchurch, do another thing. Let's go back to the West Coast. It would, it just, it would, the budget would probably blow out more than the States trip. Yeah. I can put a, you know, a handle on that. So if there's sponsors out there that want to be involved in a US <laughs> like, road trip. <laughs> like this has become a sort of a, a sales pitch. Well, the way, I, the way I'm sort of trying to imagine it to myself now, and, and if we get this across the line, I'll, I'll actually approach him, is that I'm Doco Man. So Michael Palin who was supposed to do this trip, is pulled out. <laughs> and they need to find a replacement really quick. Who have we got? Well, this, this guy here, he's, he's done a fishing show. They didn't catch any fish. But he's, he's versatile. He's, he's done, available. He's done a mystery show. He's available. He's cheap. He'll do it. <laughs> and Palin goes, are you sure? Because my reputation's online. He, he's, he'll be fine. And I go off and, and make a meal of it. And, you know, the next series, Gordon Ramsay, is not available for his <laughs> for his cooking thing through Greece. Don't worry, Docker man, he can do it. Can he cook? Yeah, he'll be fine. You know, <laughs> like so I can just take on Edinburgh can't do a jungle <laughs> episode. Don't worry, Docker man can do it. <laughs> sort of jack of all trades, master of none, Doco filmmaker. So that would be an ideal, um, what do you call it, um, concept or premise to carry on with. You know, um, <laughs> should we get across the line? But. Seems a bit far fetched now, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know, but also seems inevitable. Hey, uh, Lee, thank you so much for for coming oh, on the fold and, and sharing these these insights. It's been it's been real fascinating as a, as a massive geek of your career to to hear all this. No, thank you very much. It's been great. The fold is brought to you by the Spin Off Podcast Network, together with Vodafone. It was hosted by Duncan Greve, produced by Ti Hair Butler, with production management by Rachel Larue and series production by Jane Yee. To find out how Vodafone can help you reach your personal and business potential, visit vodafone.co.nz. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O-Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. K-pop to me means more than just listening to music. It's learning to be myself. The spin-off's new documentary, k Polys follows three Pacific youth obsessed with K-pop. In a one-off documentary, see what they've found in Korean pop culture and how they bridge it with their own. 
when you start dressing, looking different, everyone side eyes you. But in K-pop, they're just like, no, like celebrate yourself. Watch K Polys today at the spinoff.co.nz slash videos. Made with the support of New Zealand on here. The Spinoff Podcast Network.